welcome back to AI News. I am your host, Ethan. Usually, I have many questions about moral value, uh, policy, and faith for our guest. But today's guest is really out of my reach of understanding. He has a unique combination of public and private sector experiences with a quintessential American story. He served as the mayor for his home city and uh, as a city council member and as a CPA. He graduated from Stanford, major in economics, Harvard MBA, bank vice president, and advisor to some Fortune 500 companies. And right now, he is running for treasurer of California. His name is Jack Guerrero. Please tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, sure. the position you're running for. Okay, great. Thank you very much for having me on the show today. I really appreciate this opportunity to connect with your viewership because in the state of California, we really have an opportunity in November to chart a new course mm -hmm. for our state and elect responsible public servants that will promote the public interest. And the state treasurer position is one of those roles that is very, very important. The treasurer is the state's banker. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a position that manages all of the cash and investments associated with the state of California. So to give you an example of how the cash flow works, we all pay taxes into the state, of yes, course. Property. I hate it. Yes, we all we all get frustrated, <laughs> no doubt, especially when it's mismanaged. But we all pay a combination of taxes into the state of California. And of course, the state of California has a lot of expenditures that mm -hmm. it has to manage on a regular basis. But the intake and the outflow are not precisely matched um, on every instant. And so when the money comes in, it has to be managed yes. because we don't keep it between the mattresses. We actually invest it, we have to manage it. Uh, and so the treasurer is responsible for that cash management function and for all banking transactions on behalf of the state, which uh, are above $3 trillion in volume. Uh, and then in addition to that, the treasurer is also responsible for anything having to do with debt issuance in the state of California. So when California has to raise money in the market because it's spending more than revenue it's receiving, it has to go to the bond market and the treasurer is responsible for managing or issuing the bonds on behalf of the state. There are a lot of other programs and commissions that the treasurer is the head of, like the public pension funds. Mm -hmm. um, in this case, okay. actually, the treasurer is a board member of the public pension fund. So those funds need to be managed and invested. And the treasurer is a very influential uh, person when it comes to the management of the state's assets, the state's cash, the state's funds. And so think of the treasurer as the state's banker. Okay. And so in, in my uh, personal profile, I believe that I have a skill set and a personal experience that I think is very well suited for this particular role. And so I really appreciate the opportunity to talk a little bit about myself and my, my, my background. And I think it's important, by the way, that we all know the personal story of the candidates because we need to know what kind of personal experience is motivating the candidate to run for office. I think that that's a very important consideration for the voter. Of course, and that's how they understand the most. Most of us yeah. don't understand anything about treasure and then uh, how the finance the thing work, but we want to know that we elect the right person, the person that actually represents us. Yes, so, that's right. Or yeah. the person has a good ethical disposition. I think that that's very important because Indeed. too many uh, politicians are very corrupt and they think about uh, their self-interest and sometimes if we don't know their story, where they come from, why they're running, uh, it's very easy to lose sight of you know, their, their interest in the office. And so for me, I am motivated really by public service. And my story uh, begins in the 70s uh, when my parents immigrated to California from Mexico. They first settled in the Central Valley uh, as farm workers. They were picking lettuce and tomatoes and grapes. And then they later moved to Southern California and became factory workers in Vernon, uh, which is in the industrial corridor of Los Angeles County. I was born and raised in the neighboring city of Cudahy, where I subsequently served as mayor and as city council member. I went to all of the local schools in my city, and they were all really, really bad schools, very <laughs> decrepit. Uh, in fact, my high school was ranked in the bottom 10% of public schools in California. It's one of the reasons, by the way, why I champion education reform and why I think that that is the next civil rights issue of our day. So many communities, working class communities, have had 
very terrible public schools. And I think that that's a very terrible disservice for a lot of working families. And I'm very committed to remediating public education. Uh, public education, what motivate you to study this hard? Because you graduated from three top Ivy League school. What yeah. makes you to uh, motivate you to study this hard? I mean, yes. you can, came from a, a school a area where the school sucks. Yes. But it didn't stop you from Not at all. being a very successful uh, student. Yes, that's right. I think um, what um, motivated me very early on was the uh, poverty-stricken environment of the region where I was born and raised. Because it was so raw and so real, um, I, I think I knew early on as a young boy that I wanted a better life for myself uh -huh. and for my family. That early ambition um, was uh, very pronounced in me as a young boy. I remember that very distinctly. I also have to credit my parents because um, they were uh, very instrumental in inculcating the value of education in me, even though they could not help me with my academic uh, you know, studies or my, my, my actual uh, pursuit of different ac academic opportunities. But they knew on a, in a very general sense that education is the best medium for escaping poverty. Yes. And so I know a lot of Asian families in this country also subscribe very much to that point of view because of uh, the conditions that they leave from you know, the, uh, uh, the country they, they immigrate from and they come to the United States and many people um, really just want a better life for their families and they know that education is a very uh, effective vehicle for realizing uh, an improvement in one's economic lot. And so for me, that was, that was very, uh, very key early on. And when I got to high school, uh, because I realized very early on that my uh, public school education was very inadequate, I decided that I would need to supplement my high school education. So uh, when I was 14 years old, a freshman in high school, I enrolled at the state university by night so that I could take classes just to complement my high school education. And I think when I was uh, at the university as a, as a high school student, I think that opened my, my eyes uh, really to the, uh, the opportunities um, in higher education. And so um, right away when I was in high school, my mindset was already fixated on university. And so I graduated at the top of my class. I was student body president of my high school. And then I decided to go to Stanford University in the Bay Area where I studied economics. Uh, I spent one year abroad at the uh, University of Oxford in the United Kingdom, um, and I studied the history of economic thought. And I know earlier before the show, we were talking about Adam <laughs> Smith and the wealth of nations and your experience reading, uh, reading that uh, very uh, academic uh, text. Uh, so when I was at Oxford, I, I studied the history of economic thought, and that was my introduction to Adam Smith and David Ricardo and the more modern classicists like uh, Frederick von Hayek and Milton Friedman. And so for me, that was also very eye-opening about the value of the free market uh, and the pernicious consequences of government meddling in the private sector to the point where um, really our gross domestic product as a country um, empirically is undermined when government uh, gets involved, gets in the way and crowds out private yes. investment yes, because yes. government doesn't operate free of charge, right? Government is uh, taking resources from the private sector and then through public policy, reallocating capital. And sometimes that happens very inefficiently. Uh, all the time. All the time it happens yeah, very According to Adam Smith. <laughs> yes. Well, it happens uh, less efficiently than th what the market would dictate for yeah. the allocation of resources. Yeah. And when that happens, in a very practical sense, we forego the opportunity to grow our economy as much as we would if capital were efficiently allocated. Yes. So I learned very early on as an economics student that um, as well-intentioned as government policy is, when it inefficiently reallocates capital, it actually undermines the long-term growth potential of our economy. And everybody uh, is, um, is not served well when we are growing at a suboptimal level. Mm -hmm. we're, we're all affected by that. Yeah. You know, when the economy is not growing the way it should be, we're all affected by it, even indirectly, you know, because uh, we may have uh, uh, inflation, we may have um, 
other other conditions that that affect us as consumers. Uh, and so it's not just a matter of your personal labor situation, mm -hmm. but you as a consumer, the prices you pay, everybody's impacted when the economy as a whole is undermined. And so I spent some time at Stanford. I studied abroad at Oxford. Uh, and then I also attended Harvard uh, Business School and I got my master's in business administration. Uh, I worked um, for about 20 years in finance and economics at uh, the highest levels of corporate organizations. Uh, I'm a certified public accountant as well. So I got my early professional start working for the large international accounting firms like Ernst & Young and KPMG. And I worked in uh, San Francisco and Los Angeles uh, and even in Europe, I spent some time uh, working in Zurich, uh, Switzerland with Credit Suisse, one of my large clients. And so that's 20 years plus of professional experience yes. that is very relevant to a role in finance and economics like the state treasurer yeah. position. And, and plus, you know, through your experience, you actually know what the corporate want and yes. you actually know how the government run and then how... Uh, each can complement or uh, beat up each other. Yes, that's so, right. So uh, what, what's your plan? Our, our economy, California's economy, is really, really, really in the gutter right now, especially with all these unnecessary spending. Yes. Can a treasurer do anything about it or that is in the hand of the governor and the legislatures? Well, there are two things the treasurer uh, or two ways the treasurer can be very impactful. What I would call a very direct way Mm -hmm. for, the, for the treasurer in his capacity as what we call constitutional officer position. And then there's kind of an indirect way uh, where the treasurer, because of the position of the treasurer uh, and the podium that the treasurer has, uh, he can act as an advocate for the taxpayer and use the power of the podium to really push ideas and testify in the legislative committee hearings uh, to really make the case for government reform. And so I intend to use kind of both avenues, the, the very direct uh, uh, approach, okay. as well as an indirect approach with advocacy. Now on the first category, uh, the treasurer, as I mentioned earlier, is responsible for uh, managing all of the investment strategy around the funds. And here's where I wanna share with you the problem that exists today because of the political agenda of so many politicians yes. in the legislature um, around what is called the woke agenda or politicians that you know want to pursue social justice goals. When it comes to investment management decisions, believe it or not, that agenda of woke and social justice orientation has creeped into investment management decisions. And my position has always been that from an investment management position, the responsibility of the treasurer, the fiduciary responsibility of the treasurer is to maximize return yes. and minimize risk from an economic perspective. It is not the responsibility of the treasurer to allocate investment decisions based on um, which investments uh, advance social justice the best. Yeah. Because number one, the idea of social justice is very subjective. Mm -hmm. And number two, it's very susceptible to political uh, agenda. And I think that the treasurer should uh, distance himself from the political agenda and really take on the fiduciary responsibility of maximizing the return from these investments. You say like uh, investment, but that is in like a private sector, right? Uh, for California as a whole, like. We, we all know that government are the worst spender and worst in investor. They don't, yes. when they invest something, they never got a return. How can the treasurer, as a private sector, the, the way like how Adam Smith's books talk about how the economy work, it doesn't really, really necessarily translate into the government level. What can the treasurer do? What can the government invest in to have something in return and keep the government afloat? Because government is the worst spender because they have unlimited money. Whenever yeah. they don't have money, they just go like, hey, Ethan, can you give me something? Hey, hey, Mr. Jack yeah. Guerrero, can you give me something? They have unlimited customers. That's why yeah. they don't care. Yeah. So what can the treasurer do in a government level? And also another pernicious uh, situation is that government also pays no consequence for being wrong. Exactly. Right? Like if you're a private company yeah. and you're making bad decisions, eventually your shareholders yeah. will demand that you leave your position or the company will just default 
yeah. uh, or collapse because yeah. it's making bad decisions. But in government, if policymakers make bad decisions, yeah. government doesn't go away, yeah. right? They just yeah. continue their behavior. No, they have a party in front of White House and say, we beat inflation. Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. They do that. And then the scheme continues, you know? Yes. But when it comes to investment strategy, you know, we are managing large pools of money mm -hmm. that we can allocate to investments in the same way that a private sector investment management firm allocates investments into various funds. We do the same thing, like the California pension funds, for example. They have investments in foreign companies. They have investments uh, in private equity firms, mm -hmm. uh, which, by the way, have very little transparency. They invest in publicly traded uh, companies as well. So that kind of private sector discipline when it comes to investment management, it can be transferable to the government sector if you have somebody at the top uh, making these decisions that is motivated by the same discipline. And okay. so there is opportunity to invest responsibly in a way that maximizes return. Unfortunately, government in California has not been very successful. The results for the last fiscal year came out for CalPERS, which is the largest public pension fund for government workers. And the return was negative 6%, negative 6%. So they would have been better off just leaving the money where it is and not doing anything with it yeah. than the way they invested yeah. because they actually had a negative return. And historically as well, the returns have been very unattractive. Has it ever been positive before? It has been positive. There have been cycles where it's been positive. But I think the reason why it's not as high as it should be is because they're influenced by this woke agenda and by criteria that has nothing to do with return on investment. So you actually believe that as a public servant uh, in the California treasurer, you can actually use a private sector ways to invest in California and then actually have government make their own money. Is that what you're saying? Yes, that's right. Now we're talking about investment management. So we have resources that we gather from taxpayers. Uh -huh. You know, we have the cash that comes in. It needs to be managed. Now, I am an advocate for having less of that cash reallocated from the private sector because it can be more efficiently deployed in the private sector. So I am going to advocate for lower taxes so that we can more efficiently manage the economy. But when the taxes are in the state's coffers, they still need to be managed, right? Yes. I can't unilaterally say, oh, give the money back to the taxpayer because I'm not in a position of authority to change tax policy. That's the position of the legislature, yeah. the people that we elect to the assembly, to the state senate, even the governor weighs in on those kinds of policies. And the treasurer cannot do anything to directly change that legislative priority. The treasurer can advocate. Yes. And I intend to do that by testifying at legislative committee hearings. Yeah. But once the cash is in or the funds are in from taxpayers, mm -hmm. then the treasurer takes from that position forward to try to manage things responsibly. But you're right. I'm operating from a suboptimal point on the front end because we're taking in more resources than we really should. Yeah. To be honest with you. Yeah. And this is just one example of an area where the treasurer can really be impactful is on the investment management decisions. But there's also debt uh, that I talked about that's uh, really, really important. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know if your re viewers realize, but whenever we borrow money, it's not free money, right? We have to pay it back. And for every dollar that we incur in debt, we have to pay $2 back in 30 years. Mm -hmm. $2 is our it's, cost. It's, it's that little? I thought I thought it, the number will be even greater. Well, it adds up pretty quickly, right? I yeah. mean, if you're doing a $30 billion bond issuance, that means we're going to pay $60 billion for that. Yeah. And that's a lot of money to give away. And the reason why we have to pay so much, uh, both in interest as well as in transaction costs, is because the state's credit rating is so unattractive. It's so relatively poor compared to other states. We have an investment grade rating, but the key question is how does it compare to all other states? And from that perspective, our credit rating is almost at the bottom. We are almost six states have, just about six states have a worse credit rating than us. Mm -hmm. So of those six states, Illinois is one of the ones that is just about to fall apart <laughs> because of the same trajectory of mismanagement that is afflicting 
the state of California. Unbalanced budgets, excessive debt levels, these things add up and contribute to having a, a very poor credit rating. And that's why we pay so much interest and so much transaction costs. And I think the treasurer, as the administrator of the bond issuances, can use the authority of the office to stall the process a little bit, if necessary, to raise awareness about the predicament that we're getting ourselves in, to go to the legislature and explain to the legislature what you are about to do and embark on this new bond issuance is going to cost taxpayers this much more money. So the treasurer can kind of insert himself in the process and make sure that the legislators are aware of exactly the consequence of their actions. Uh, one other thing I did want to talk about is, as it relates to the treasurer function is the pension funds. This yes. is a, a very important issue and very few media outlets talk about it. Very few politicians talk about it because many of them are very scared of the public sector unions that control a lot of the political narrative in the state. And many of them, of course, contribute substantial sums to campaign committees, and it creates uh, an incentive for politicians to basically do whatever the unions say. Yeah. But the cold reality is that we have an unfunded pension liability in the state of California of $1 trillion. This is the difference between the future stream of obligations, promises that we have made to public sector retirees, yes. and the present value of the assets. That gap is $1 trillion in present value. Wow. And for comparison, for your viewers, the size of the annual budget in California is about $300 billion a year. This was a, a special year. They, they spent so much more. So it's about $300 billion. But if you do the math, it means we, have to, we would have to shut down government tomorrow, like just close the doors to government, shut <laughs> down all the buildings yeah. for the next three to four years and continue to tax you several times over just to recover from this gap. Yeah, I think uh, from what I read from all these leftist uh, groups, each time we borrow money, we're basically borrowing from the future, yes. our future generation. And what their defense is, are we going to borrow these money from the future generation and we're going to make an economy that is so great and then we're going to build something so amazing and then it's going to fix it for the future and the future generation will thank us. What are your thoughts on this kind of mentality that the, the leftist is trying to portray? And then yeah. they say that the government can make the decisions for you and your kids and your grandkids. What are they actually trying to do? Well, there are a lot of fallacies with that uh, argument. Number one, as we talked about earlier, um, the private sector does a better job, really, of allocating capital than government does. So even if government is well-intentioned and they really do want to create an infrastructure for the future that will benefit everybody in the future, historically, government has done a terrible job of execution. Yeah. You know, cost overruns is normal in yeah. the state of California. The, the, the railroad. The railroad. The, the airplane. Oh, yes. Yeah, everything is from the private sector. and The government always invests and nothing come out. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you probably heard of the bullet train uh, that is supposed to go from Los Angeles to Northern California. Yeah. There's a bullet train that they're trying to build, like light rail, you know, yeah. uh, you go to other countries, they have a, a very, you know, robust uh, transportation infrastructure. And I think the legislators wanted to do something similar. And initially it was, okay, this is going to be a $20 billion project. And then, okay, no, it's going to be $30 billion. Okay, it's going to be more like 60 Now the estimate is over $100 billion. Oh, wow. So they're getting something wrong, right? If they're constantly having these cost overruns. And this is just one example. Every other infrastructure project in California is always over budget. And there are always cost overruns. And it's amazing to me that we let it continue because we as citizens can really put a, a break on that by voting responsibly and getting good people in into office. Let me give you another example of how government uh, is so poor at managing resources. In Los Angeles City, you probably have heard about the homeless crisis. Uh -huh. And of course, through a variety of funding at state and federal levels, the local municipality has invested in housing for the homeless. Yeah. And there is a, a large building, I think it's on the west side, maybe in Koreatown, uh, where they built a, an entire building to house 
individual homeless people, and it on average comes out to just under a million dollars per unit. Uh, what a studio unit? Now there are many homes you can buy in Southern California for less than a million dollars. So something <laughs> I, I, I need a million dollars. <laughs> yeah, for, I mean, for this is for a homeless studio. You know, it makes no sense. And the reason is because when government is involved, it has to use you know union labor. Uh, there's political oversight, and you add all these layers of process and oversight. And uh, uh, union involvement, and 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 suddenly it starts to add up, and the process for governing is very very slow as well. I'm on the city council in my city, uh, and I became mayor of my city, and I can tell you before I got involved in government, I was very skeptical of government. Now that I am involved in government, I'm even more skeptical of government okay. because I see how government works. It's very very slow to. Uh, develop projects, and then you have so many special interest groups that have an economic interest in what the city is doing, or in the case of the state, what state government is doing, and they manage to insert themselves in the process and influence policymakers into making bad decisions that benefit the special interests. So there's an element of corruption in the way government functions. Yeah. To be honest with you, and I think that that's one of the reasons why I want to come into this role. And provide a little bit more discipline in the way that the treasurer functions.、Um, I mentioned earlier as well that the treasurer is、um, in charge of a lot of commissions that involve the issuance of low interest financing to private companies that have a public interest. So I mentioned earlier the、uh, the treasurer is responsible for、um, leading various、uh, commissions and committees, and one of them、uh, is dedicated to. Uh, extending low interest financing to private companies that uh, uh, ostensibly have a public interest, and there's about four billion dollars in one of the committees that the treasurer can allocate. But what I have to ask myself is, if you go to their website now, the treasurer's website, and you、yeah. want to apply for this low interest financing or bonds issued by the treasurer's office to benefit your company,、uh, and you want to apply, it says right now on the website, no, no more money available. Yeah. Okay. So then, that means that some players in the private sector benefited, and others did not.、Uh -huh. And so, who's making the decision about the winners and the losers? Is it the treasurer himself?、Um, is it a committee? What is the criteria?、Uh, and and you know, this is where you start to get into、uh, lack of transparency. And maybe an environment that really leads itself to corruption, because you then have a lot of power resting in individuals that are allocating resources, and sometimes the criteria is not well known, it's not well established, and the question for me becomes: Is it the company with the biggest lobbyist? Is it the business owner that is making campaign donations to the legislator or to the treasurer?、Uh, these are really important questions, and. And that's why I'm I'm always very concerned when government is taking resources from the people, and then through arbitrary criteria allocating that to favored businesses and picking winners and losers and acting as a moderator, as an arbiter of who is going to win in the economy and who's not going to win in the economy. And right now, if you look at the law in California, it's really a patchwork of. Uh, exceptions, carve-outs, special tax rates for this industry in this geography, but not in this geography, and it just becomes a maze of very complicated、uh, benefits that go to some groups and not to other groups, and and I think that makes the whole system susceptible to corruption. Yeah, let, let's talk about corruption because California, as long as well as New York,、uh, Illinois, these governments are one of the Most corrupt government. What can you do as a California treasurer to do something about this corruption right here? And and how did the corruption start? I mean, you talk about it in the a little bit in the beginning, but yeah, yeah. how do you how do we stop it? Because as a normal citizen, every day we we see corruption every、yeah. day. We see corruption in the news. We see corruption in our own life. We see corruption in our own cities. What、yeah. can we do, and what can you do as a California treasurer? Well, as citizens, we have an obligation to call out corruption whenever we see it. 
We uh-huh. have to call it out. In my own city, there was a corruption scandal. <laughs> they would just scandal. call the cops and arrest you. <laughs> that would be easy. That would be easy. But sometimes they, you know, the, the corruption schemes are very complex. Uh-huh. Uh, there was a case in Bell. This is my neighboring city about 10 years ago. This was a city where the city manager was paying himself $1.5 million a year in mm-hmm. compensation um, in a town where the average income is $30,000 a year. But it was a real mystery to figure out how much he was really getting paid because the contract with his employment terms did not spell out the compensation. It referred to another attachment and then that attachment referred to another agreement. So it was like a maze just to find out how, how much, much is this getting. guy getting paid. Yeah. And, and he had multiple contracts and, and so it took journalistic investigation to find the truth. Uh, and it shouldn't be that complicated because we have laws in the state of California uh, that um, allow the public to request information um, at any time. And the government, unless there's a compelling uh, interest like uh, personnel details, like Social Security numbers for um, workers at City Hall, obviously we wouldn't want to release that kind of information. But most everything else it should be in the public domain. Yeah. And when people ask for it, they are entitled to receive documents and information. And I think more of us as citizens need to start demanding well, it, information. Is, is, it, is it possible as a California treasurer that every uh, season you can give up a report and go like, oh, absolutely. hey, the, these cities' mayor and these cities' legislature, they're actually getting paid by the government uh, or, or they, they are actually having all these income into their cities for no good reason and to their own pocket. Can you, can you do a report like that so to, to warn the people in the cities? Because I don't think right now we have this kind of report. And then uh, most uh, journal, journalists, they're too lazy to find out something like this. And I, I don't understand it. Yeah. So is, is it possible for the treasurer of California to do something like that? I think there's a lot the treasurer can do. There are other positions as well that are charged with auditing uh, cities and government agencies like the state controller. Uh, there are other positions under the governor that also do it. But I think some of these positions are under a cloud of political influence. It is. And yeah. sometimes it's very hard for them to uh, kind of go above and beyond or push the envelope because they're controlled by political influence. Yeah. And so if I manage to get elected as treasurer from a political party that is different from the majority party, right away we have a check and balance because I'm not beholden to the majority party of the legislature. And I can act a lot more independently. And using the resources of the treasurer's office, I think that there's a lot that the treasurer can do, for example, to manage um, the uh, and provide oversight and transparency to the results of investment decisions at the local level. How much does this city invest uh, its resources, how much return does the city get for these resources, how is the money being spent. I think there are metrics, broad metrics that the treasurer can um, can uh, supervise. And and I do want to be the, the head of an office that is known for transparency. Yeah. I mean, right now, if you go to the website for the state treasurer's office, it's, it's very difficult to find information, to be honest. Yeah. And so if, if the treasurer's office can be known uh, uh, as the center of transparency and reliable and credible information sharing, I think that that will be a tremendous service to taxpayers. Yeah, and I think it's a uh, government's obligation to do something like that because uh, I used to work in a bank when I was 19 years old, which is like 20 years ago. So uh, they, they, we have every time someone deposits enough cash, they, we have to fill up a SAR, a suspicious oh, yes. active SAR activity report. report. Yes. And when we fill it out, the government will know automatically, oh, something's wrong with over here. Something's mm-hmm. wrong over here. Can the California state, can, can we obligate the government to do a report like that? Because we know there is many cities, they go like, hey, we have, let's have a meeting. And then uh, once they come here, they sign up and they get something, uh, government have to pay them. Uh, for for no reason, maybe the meeting is only five minutes. Yes, right. And then and then uh, they they kept just kept doing this kind of meeting and just stupid spending by our government. It's the only way to enrich themselves. That's a very good. That's a very good idea, by the way, that you just brought up. Because 
Uh, it works very effectively in the banking sector with the SAR reports. Yeah. Um, I know for a fact from the Treasurer, uh, the United States Department of the Treasury, where I used to work many years ago, that uh, those are very uh, valuable uh, points of information. And I think in government, um, we can do something very similar where uh, expenditures, I mean, we could have a criteria that's very algorithmically um, uh, most helpful for uh, alerting taxpayers to irregularities or fraud yeah and, and you can devise an algorithm I think that you know it, it asks for the, the most precise uh, instances uh, that are more likely to be you know susceptible to fraud like up you know in uh, reporting all expenditures above a certain threshold in excess of the city managers spending authority I mean little things like this or report all expenditures where the uh, contract was achieved outside of a public bidding competitive process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All of those yeah, need yeah. to be reported. And then um, the campaign contributions from those entities yeah. to the council members. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something like, like if you just yeah. report this, and you can come up with a formula, and, yeah. you know, where, where, where you can get, because you don't want to have too much information overload, too much information for consumption can be overwhelming. Yeah. So you want to make sure you converge on the most helpful information. Yes, yes. Uh, and so, um, uh, well, I should backtrack. I, I think all information is important. Yes. We should, we should put all information out there. But in terms of reports, special yeah. reports, to alert people to uh, the risk of fraud or yeah. susceptibility to mismanagement, having very focused reports. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. You know, are, are where we can algorithmically come up with uh, really the right combination of questions to ask yeah. and reporting. But I love that idea. That's just highlight for the people. Hey, your government what might be some, doing something really, really suspicious. Yeah, right. And then you should go find out what, what, what it is. And then the government have to explain it. And I you think, know, we could yeah. do a better job uh, of, of that uh, today because, uh, believe it or not, in, in California, all elected officials have to file reports <sighs> about where they are getting uh, their money, their campaign donations. Yeah. They have to file reports. But those reports are not periodic. I uh -huh. mean, they're not, they're not frequent. If you're not r running for office and you're an elected official, you only have to report that twice a year. No, you know, is that so? 6.30 and 12.31. Uh, so twice a year you report who gave you money. Um, and then there's another form that reports who gave you gifts. And, and you report that once a year. But what if you receive a campaign contribution in March, and then in June, you're voting on a contract for that person that gave you money? Mm. You will not know that until December comes and you have to file your report in December. Uh, or, or, well, there's a mid-year report, but, um, um, but there's a lag in the reporting. Yeah. And that's my point. That and may, you, can't, may... you can't really catch it because the government contracts always stretch out for so long. Yeah, and right. then uh, you, you cannot systematically follow up. Not like a company that you own. So yeah, you, can, right. you can do so. That, that is another thing that, oh my God, this can go on for like five hours. Oh, I'm hours. sure. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, we, 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 I, uh, we've been having a lot yeah, of, well, a lot of yeah, good conversations. I'm, I'm going to go to yeah. San Diego next time and then yes. uh, take my whole family there I for know. a vacation and talk to you. I know. <laughs> oh my That's God. right. That's this right. is so, so much fun. Oh my God. Yeah, a lot uh, of topics, uh, no doubt. Yeah. But I would say, you know, the, the most important thing right now, because we're going to have an election yes. in 30 days. Yes. The most important thing right now for your, your viewers is to vote for elected officials that want to do the right thing for the people. And I think transparency and reducing the size of government, uh, advocating for the taxpayer, these are the things that I think voters need to really look out for. And then look at people's track record as well. I've been a mayor and a council member, and I have never received money from, a, uh, from my city campaign accounts from any vendor or um, uh, contractor that does business with my city because even though it's legal to me it's a conflict of interest and I have demonstrated over the years that I refuse to play that game and I have been an advocate as well for public education reform I've been an advocate for lower taxes and I have a track record of that and so what I tell people when they think about who to vote for is number one are they fighting for the right position on the issues are they competent Oh, you know, yeah. and then are they ethical? Those are the criteria that I think are important. They're essential, and uh, 
and I think that I, I humbly submit my candidacy for your viewers' consideration because those are the three criteria that are uh, very important to me as well. To the viewers, thank you very much for listening in on this interview. I'm really appreciative of the opportunity to introduce myself. Please vote on November 8th. It is so important that we fulfill our duty as citizens of this great country to make sure that we vote on November 8th. Thank you very much for your time and consideration. It's amazing. What an amazing guy. Wow. Thank you. Study so hard. Three top Ivy League school. I mean, everyone can tell that today's episode, I am completely outmatched. <laughs> <That's pretty funny. laughs> this guy is just way too smart for it. But I think he is on the right track. Uh, I don't understand economic that well, but I, I, I believe you have like way better idea than what I have. I'm, I'm just trying to control the government in, in sense the way that he, they control us. Yes. But everyone, please go out and talk about his name and share this episode. Share it to your neighbors, share it to everyone. This time there's no district. You don't have to under, you, you don't have to say like, oh, is he from district 22? Is he from district something, something, something? He is for all Californian. If you live in California and you care about what our government is doing, you care about your tax money and how they're going to spend it, take a look at this guy. And then uh, he is going to fight for you. Not like Janet Yellen, like the, our, uh, what we have in uh, yeah. White House right now. So please go to his website and then take a look at uh, his policy and his uh, amazing work. And uh, thank you for coming today. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh -huh.